eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Hell. Hello, everyone. We're here for another fresh episode of Peak Human, hot off the press. I've been recording these each week and posting them within a few days to make sure they're current and relevant. For those of you who are new to the show, I'm Brian Sanders and I'm creating the Food Lies film, which we are trying to finish by the end of the year. We got slowed down a bit due to the current state of the world, but are actively working on it daily. I also work with an internal medicine physician, Dr. Gary Schliffer, here in Los Angeles, where we treat patients with diet and lifestyle instead of rushing to medications. In fact, our goal is to remove as many medications as possible, which we are successfully doing across the board. We have just launched a Sapien program where people can radically change their life with our physician-supervised diet and lifestyle program that includes videos, written materials, visual resources, and health coaching. You can learn more about it and get the free Sapien food guide at sapien.org. Anyone in the world can take part in this program if they're serious about losing weight and dedicating themselves to a change. We're all about making it fun, delicious, sustainable, and enjoyable. This isn't about counting calories, being hungry, or needing tons of willpower. Get the food guide for free at sapien.org. We also have the Sapien Tribe for people who have already made diet and lifestyle changes and are looking to further their knowledge and keep themselves motivated, accountable, and up to date on new info. It's an amazing group of people that help each other grow. We also have a ton of perks like our private members area, private Zoom community meetings, extended show notes of the podcast, and unlisted video resources on meal prep and exercise routines. You can also find out about this and join at sapien.org. Get in on the ground floor of this community and become a founding member for life with a deep discount on a lifetime membership. We're running out of these limited spots. We're building something special together. Brian Lenskis is an internal medicine doctor in San Diego. Dr. Lenskis received a BS in biology from UC Irvine and an MD from USC Medical School. He practices root cause medicine and has moved away from the standard insurance-based medical system to a direct primary care model to better serve his patients. He also speaks around the country on the benefits of diet and lifestyle-based medicine. We speak today on the future of medicine. Not only does this, of course, rely on root cause medicine and diet and lifestyle intervention, but aligned incentives, new technology, and a collaborative model. This includes wearable technologies such as CGM or continuous glucose monitors, smart blood pressure cuffs, smart scales, and more. Things will really make sense concerning our current nightmare of a healthcare system after listening to this episode. Once again, please go to the new version of sapien.org to get the free sapien food guide, learn about our nosetail.org grass-finished meat delivery service from our ranch in Texas, and to join the sapien tribe. Thanks so much for supporting this podcast with a review and sharing it with friends and family. Now here's my friend, Dr. Brian Lenskis. All right, we're live. Dr. Brian Lenskis, how's it going? Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to join you. For sure. The Bryans unite. Again, man, we had you on our podcast. Now it's my turn to come pick on your listeners too. So this is kind of fun. For sure. If people don't know, he does a great podcast with Dr. Tro. Dr. Tro was on Peak Human a while back. Great guy doing great things in New York. Brian's in San Diego. And yeah, your podcast called the Low Carb MD Podcast. And that's a great one as well. Yeah, we're trying to keep up with you guys. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? We have uh, we have similar ratings in the podcast app, I think. <laughs> it's because we have a lot of people voting multiple times, our mom and dads and all that stuff. Oh, I like that trick. Maybe I should use that. <laughs> well, if you like any of either of our podcasts, give us a review in the app store. You know, why not? Today, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but I think the main thing is the future of medicine. That's kind of going to frame our discussion. And you're doing great things with direct primary care leaving the system. So we'll get into all that stuff. But just know we're this is the framing of our discussion. Like what can the healthcare system be? I don't think anyone thinks it's great now. Right. So we can talk about the problems. We can talk about where it could go. And we'll talk about your story, first of all, is how you got into medicine and, and your sort of personal journey because we hung out in Denver semi recently before lockdown and I saw a great film called Fat Fiction that you were featured in. And 
tell me about it and type of thing. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, they reached out to me and Jen from Fat Fiction, you know, reached out and said, hey, Brian, we want you. In. And she reached out like four or five times. I kept blowing her off because I was so busy. I didn't have time because I was in the standard medical model. You know, I was working 14 hour days, didn't have time. But, you know, basically I started out just I was at UC Irvine and went down to Mexico with a group of docs. And I wasn't even planning on going to medical school. They were from USC and they were great people and they helped a lot of people and did a lot of volunteer work. And so I said, this is kind of a cool thing to do. And so anyways, I had good grades and, and applied and got into USC. And the rest is history. You know, I went through residency. And one of the reasons I got into the low carb realm was struggling with my weight. My whole family's decimated with diabetes and early death on my mom's side. And I saw how the effects of lifestyle would shorten life. And I thought, you know, I, I don't want to be in that road. So came across Jason Fung, of course, like everyone else who's in this realm and, and, you know, a lot of other great leaders out there and started looking into the low carb and saying, hey, you know, this seems to work. And then I applied it to my patients and saw the benefit after I was having some personal success. And then I saw what Professor Noakes and, and Gary Fedke were going through. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll just be quiet and do this in my little stretch of the woods and not bring attention to myself. But then I was having such clinical success and I just couldn't keep quiet about it. Then we started our podcast. And then everything kind of grew from there. And that's how, how I ended up you know, crossing paths with fat fiction and getting to do that with some of my patients. And that was a great honor for me. And it's just an impressive thing to see you know, the impact that we have on lives because you know, we go into medicine to really impact lives. And then after some point, you realize we're just throwing drugs at people and not really helping them anymore. And that, that mm. was kind of my, you know, my epiphany saying, gosh, do I want to help people or do I, do I want to make a lot of money, right? Yeah, that's just the standard thing is everyone in our world kind of just broke free from that. And it feels like there's so many people stuck in that world. So yeah, what was that world like or what, how did you get out of it? Well, for 17 years, really, until now, I'm, I haven't even started my new practice yet. We're putting all the pieces together, having meetings and getting all, everything, all the technology put together with the help of Tro, who's been doing this for a while. And, uh, you know, I just started looking at the system saying, gosh, there's a problem. When doctors have a vested interest in putting more bi diagnostic codes down, you know, the more we code for the more we get paid back. The insurance companies have this mindset that the sicker the patient is, the more the doctor should get paid. And I'm thinking, well, heck, if I spend a lot of times preventing illness, I get docked on my pay because of that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a crazy uh, view of the world at some point because I was working 14-hour days. And you know, one of the big influences on me was Ben Bickman, who's uh, from BYU, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the key guys in metabolic health and longevity. And I just had a quick conversation with him. And he basically said, look, keep your insulin as low as you can if you want to live a long life. And the first two things he says is don't work 14-hour days, don't be crazy working and, and get enough sleep. And I thought, uh oh, I'm 0 for 2. And then he said, okay, watch your diet, you know, exercise regularly, don't smoke or drink to excess, and uh, you know, don't put yourself in, in, in situations. Make sure you get enough sleep and, and lifestyle. I'm like, well, that doesn't seem like it's very difficult. Why are us docs dying 10 years before our patients, right? We run ourselves into the ground. And we might be good at one or two of those things, but looking at all five of those things, you say, well, you know, maybe we need to make some changes. Yeah, I love Ben Dickman. Great guest on the Peak Human podcast. So how, yeah, did you have your own kind of health journey too? Like, didn't you, you sort of? Yeah, I lost about 30 pounds right away doing low carb, ketogenic diet type stuff, just experimenting with intermittent fasting. I've tried pescatarian diet for a little while. I've tried different things to see how my body reacts to that. And so, yeah, I, I was pre-diabetic three years ago and, uh, you know, now my sugars are normal. My metabolic numbers look good and I'm feeling great, you know? So I think there's a lot to... You know, for us docs, I think one of the disadvantages most docs have is that they've never struggled with obesity, diabetes, and all this kind of stuff. And when you struggle with it, you realize that the standard of care isn't working. Having green shakes for breakfast and, and having a bunch of uh, snacks all through the day it just wasn't working for me. But I thought, well, initially we think all of our patients are non-compliant, but then we realize, heck, I'm compliant and it's not working. What do I have to change? And that's what put me on this journey. Mm, yeah. Well, that's what I've realized. It's just that advice is bad. I, one of my main messages is I see so many people trying and, you know, I'm seeing people with Dr. Gary in our clinic and they're trying. So many people are trying and they're following it and it's just not working. It's not the willpower. It's the recommendations. Exactly. The people are following our recommendations. We're just giving bad advice. That's the big problem. Everyone says, oh, just exercise more and eat less. And that's kind of the joke I make on the podcast is that's like golf is saying, all you have to do is hit the white ball in the hole and it's easy. Well, it's not yeah. that easy. There's more to the game than that. It's not just eating less and exercising more. If, if it was, how do, we'd you all get be how do you get right? better at golf? It's like, oh, just fewer strokes. 
Yeah, fewer strokes. Just hit in the in there. Like you know, I was I was saying, well, if you're gonna drown, if you're in the middle of the ocean, just breathe more air than water. You know. I guess I should throw in my eat densely, move intensely. Then. Yeah. Exactly. Then, exactly. Yeah. Exactly what you're talking about. It starts getting toward what you should actually be doing. Some actual recommendations. Some actionable info. So. So yeah, I have a problem. We'll get more into the problems of the medical industry before we get into the solutions. Because I have a problem because we're working with someone new where if it's a great woman who has a lot of weight to lose and she found us and she's she's really excited, taking all our recommendations from day one. She's 269 pounds, you know, has a lot of weight to lose. And we asked her doctor, We she doesn't have our insurance. We're like, oh, why don't you just go to your old doctor? Can you get these blood tests? The doctor would not get her the blood test that we asked. He would not get her an A1C. I thought an A1C was normal. He somehow said he couldn't get A1C, wouldn't get a CRP, and wouldn't get fasting insulin. And she just said no. It's just so weird to me. What is going on there? Is, is it like an ego thing? You know, it's another doctor asking another doctor. Or is it he just doesn't know? He doesn't get it? Like this woman is 269 pounds. Like he's just like, no, she doesn't have diabetes. Like how do you know she doesn't have diabetes if you won't do these tests? What's up with this? Yeah, it's it's a combination of the, all of the above. There's ego involved for sure, but the doctor's thinking you order these esoteric tests. Uh, A1C, by the way, is not an esoteric test. Exactly. But you know, some people want all these weird nuclear. Well, the CRP, medicine. yeah, Isn't yeah. CRP normal. <laughs> yeah, CRP is normal. Like all those things are critical markers, and clearly the doctor doesn't understand metabolic health, right? Because those are all markers we look at and say, uh oh, there's a trouble here. Because again, you know, knowing a fasting insulin is critical. I mean, there's cash pay labs people can go on. It costs 26 bucks to get a fasting insulin. That tells us a ton of information. So, yeah, it, it's a combination of docs. We're kind of rule followers. And, and the other thing is the doctor's looking and saying, I don't want to have to do a prior authorization, argue with the insurance company because it's not going to get paid for. Those kind of things, a lot of stuff, especially with Medicare, if you don't have an indication to order something, you can't order it. And with COVID, one of the big things we see is vitamin D deficiency being correlated with increased mortality. But we can't mm -hmm. check a vitamin D level unless we have documented low vitamin D. How mm -hmm. do you do that without checking it? It's a crazy system we're in. Those kind of things that, that make us nutty when we want to check something and we're, our hands are tied. You know, you can't just get routine lead, uh, screening lipids on people if they don't have some reason to get that. So how do you know without checking the numbers? Like, you know, it's kind of one of those things. You hope they come back abnormal so you can justify and ordering it. It's a crazy system for sure. No doubt about it. So I come in healthy, but okay, for one thing, this woman is overweight, right? She's clinically obese. So I feel like that should be reason enough. But when I went in a couple of years ago, I told them, well, hey, well, I'm changing my diet. I'm doing this extreme crazy diet with high fat. <laughs> and the doctor was like, oh, okay, fine. I guess we can do that because you're doing this dangerous diet or something. <laughs> so there's just a little tip there. If, you know, people are in good shape and the doctor won't get it, then just you can figure it out. Well, and, the, and that's a big problem. We can't look at someone and say they're in good shape too. And that's the big problem we have. I mean, some people you look at them and say they're sick. You could tell by looking at them, but there's a lot. I have 12 people in my old practice that were under 160 pounds that had type 2 diabetes. So you can't mm -hmm. look and say, oh, they're thin. They can't have diabetes. Yes, they can. So you have to look at all the other markers. And, and you know, I think that's where we look at the big, we step back and look at the big puzzle piece and put the pieces together. Right. That is true. Well, I just did a long podcast with Dr. Phil Maffetone. He's an old school, high fat, low carb guy. And he kind of coined over fat in the literature and talked about this and that you can be over fat and be of normal weight. And absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And then looking at like visceral fat. So what, what kind of stuff do you guys look at now? I guess we can transition into the, the new way of doing things. And there's this, there's a whole new world out there for medical uh, healthcare. Yeah. What, really what are you guys looking at? Really, I mean, some of the bigger tests that we like to get that I like to get as a baseline, especially when there's question about low carb stuff, is getting a, a coronary calcium score in, in the appropriate patient of looking to see if they have disease or not. That allows us to look at that LDL they have and say, OK, is this a bad thing or not so bad thing? You know, a lot of athletes will tend to have higher LDL scores. Right. But they also have very high HDL, the good cholesterol and very mm -hmm. low triglycerides. So we feel better about that. And, you know, so those are the, that when we look at the lipid panel. The problem is it's like saying, okay, how much money do you make? Can you live in Los Angeles? Well, there's a lot of other factors involved. You have to say, how much money are you spending? Do you have two ex-wives or you know, palimony and, mm -hmm. you know, or all this kind of, of stuff. LA. Yeah, and what part of LA and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Palisades so, or, yeah, like the Yeah, East exactly. LA. 
Exactly. So you need more information. So people say my LDL is this is a good or bad. It's like, I have no idea. We have to have some more information on that. So really having an A1C, like you're saying, a fasting insulin level tells us a lot about metabolic health. The triglycerides tell us a lot. And fasting insulin level, although it's not a perfect test, tells us a heck of a lot. If someone's if fasting insulin is through the roof, you think, uh oh, or glucose. What did you say? Glucose or insulin one time? Well, glucose and insulin. So they're, the thing is, Ben Bickman has a perfect graph looking at this. So what will happen is if you have someone who's pre-diabetic, we have about 10 years that that insulin level creeps up and up and up. The fasting insulin keeps going up to a certain point. But the sugar and, and A1C, which is the three-month sugar average, and the spot sugar look pretty good. Then all of a sudden, your body cannot handle that increased glucose load, and it stops making insulin or decreases that amount. And then when that stops or starts going down, the insulin will spike up like crazy. So what we're doing in Western medicine right now is we wait till that happens. So after they've stopped making insulin, after they start getting into major problems, they want to treat it now and say, okay, we're going to put you on insulin. Well, it wasn't that they had a shortage of insulin. It was an oversupply of sugar and they filled up all their sugar stores. So you can think of it as all their, their storage units were full. Now they have nowhere else to put it. And now it overflows into diabetes, right? So there's some people, I've seen people 700 pounds that don't have type two diabetes. And I've seen people that are 160 that have it. Right. So it, it's really that you run out of places to store the sugar and then you start getting into trouble. Yeah. That's kind of the part of the personal fat threshold theory is that you can, at different weights, people have different genetics and different numbers of fat cells and, yeah, different levels of being inflamed or not or how many, if they can multiply or not. Then also, yeah, I wanted to, I brought that up because that's why we need the fasting insulin is because you can have a normal glucose because you're putting out so much insulin and not know that there's a problem. Correct. And so it's that high insulin, as some people call it hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistant. They're different, similar, but they're a little bit different. You know, sleep deprivation, for instance, can make you very insulin resistant. And, and so you get the stress hormones. And so when you start stepping back and looking at the big picture of metabolic health, and that's what we're talking, that's what you and I are talking about saying, okay, how do we put ourselves in the best neighborhood we can? You can get mugged anywhere, but you know, downtown LA in the middle of the night versus La Jolla, San Diego in the middle of the day, I mean, you're, you play the odds at some point. So you do what you can to minimize your risk factors, mm -hmm. right? Also back to LDL too, there's so much context. Like you said, the HDL, the triglycerides. So yeah, like lean mass hyper responders. So I kind of have high LDL, but really good HDL and triglycerides. So that is some happens with some athletic people. There's also even just based on your diet too, well, this is the nuance that people don't look at in the mainstream is they think it all matters. LDL is all that matters, but they're not looking at the next level, right? It's like if you have high LDL and you have a terrible diet and you're eating the wrong foods and you have, you know, bad HDL and trigs, then LDL could be a problem. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly right. So you look at the neighborhood it's in, right? Kind of the funny example we talk about if someone's kids, if you have a kid and I say, is this kid going to turn out to be good or bad? You know, you say, well, it depends. What are the parents like? Are they living in a drug neighborhood where everyone's shooting each other and there's prostitution everywhere? Or are they living in Ben Bickman's neighborhood where it's a dad spends all the time with the kids and does, all, uh, of course, it, you can have a bad outcome no matter which neighborhood you're in. But when you play the odds, you go, okay, odds are, depending where you're, what neighborhood you're in is where you're going to end up. And that's the same thing metabolically. If, if that LDL is sitting in a bad neighborhood, it's not very good. So for instance, diabetics are a bad neighborhood metabolically. We know it's an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, probably the biggest risk factor. And so when you see a diabetic with high LDL, you say, hmm, this isn't good. You know, a lot of the guidelines say any diabetic with the elevated A1C should be on a statin drug stamped. It's just a stamp. As soon as you got that diagnosis, you're on that and an ACE inhibitor, rather than saying, oh, what, what can we do to bring down the blood pressure? What can we do to treat the, the diabetes? So that's one of the conundrums we get into with this kind of medicine is I have several patients who come off all of their insulin. They've, they're off all their diabetes medicines. Their, their A1C is normal. Everything's great. And then I keep getting letters saying this patient needs to be on a statin. And I'm like, their coronary calcium is zero. Their numbers look great. Everything's normal. Why exactly? Because once diabetic, always diabetic, right? So that's the mindset because no one thinks you could reverse the disease or put it into remission depending how you want to talk about it. So this is a new paradigm for people because we've never seen it before. Yeah. Most people haven't even heard of a coronary calcium score. Can you explain that a little more? Yeah, that's something, uh, you know, I first heard about it through Ivor Cummins, really. He's from Ireland and looking at the heart disease. And, and so what a coronary calcium score it does is looks at a, a, the calcium is an indirect marker of cardiovascular damage. So the higher your coronary calcium, the more plaque you most likely have. You know, and so that's generally what they're looking at. So if someone has a really high coronary calcium, it grabs your attention and you want to look at that and say, okay, this person may be at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Is it perfect? No. You know, I have some people that have a through the roof 
coronary calcium score, send them for a stress test, and they do fine. Some mm -hmm. of the complicating factors is being on a statin drug will increase your coronary calcium. So if someone's been on a statin drug for a lot of years, they're going to have an increased coronary calcium score. But that, does that mean they're at increased risk of a heart attack? No, because, uh, you know, they talk a lot about stabilizing plaques. And, you know, there's different arguments that, you know, people try to justify their views on things. Um, mm -hmm. But but that's basically, it gives you an idea of where you're at. Because if someone has a high LDL and they're 62 years old, and I've seen it, and it completely zero coronary calcium score, what's the odds of that person developing extensive disease over the next 20 years, right? When they haven't developed in their first 60 very years. low. That's exactly what I was going to say is that it's a great indicator of someone. It's like physical evidence almost that they are okay. I always say it's like, why are we looking at LDL? There's a hundred markers. The person is feeling better, losing weight. LHDL, every single thing is good. And then the LDL could be a little high, but then the CAC is zero. Like, come on, guys. Yeah, exactly. So that's why we have to look at the big picture. And then we, the more information, the more data set we have, the better off we could be at making a decision. And, you know, to get a coronary calcium score costs 100 bucks. So when I heard about it, I so said, I'm getting it. I want to know I've, you know, been overweight, you know, pre-diabetic and all that. And, you know, then you can make a, a decision based on that when you have data. So that's it. You know, those are things that I looked at and I thought, hmm, let's look at it. And, you know, one of the big things coming back to that cardiac disease, I was at Low Carb uh, San Diego from Low Carb USA. Ivor Cummings was there talking about this and, and they were talking about Dr. Kraft's data. And it was interesting because they raised the point I had never checked an insulin before that. He said, you know, check the insulin level. That's the biggest correlation with cardiovascular disease. I thought that can't be right. So I went back to my practice. I had I think I had eight people that have had bypass or multiple stents and every single one of them had elevated insulin levels. I thought, hmm, not all of them had high LDL, by the way. And some of them were already on treatment before I met them. So I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Could insulin be a factor? And that, now we're seeing more data. Columbia did a huge study showing that insulin is a huge factor for cardiovascular disease. So then it comes back to saying, okay, we've been telling people to be on a low fat diet. So generally, what do you do? You take out the fat and you put in carbohydrates, which spikes insulin insulin level. You know, people who are under major stress, all these risk factors we look at and say, well, it makes sense now from that perspective. You know, you say, well, if you're stressed all the time, not sleeping and, you know, some of the stuff I was doing, I said, well, I'm kind of a hypocrite at this point because I know those are bad for me, but I keep doing it. It's kind of like telling people not to smoke, but smoking two packs a day, right? So uh, us doctors are pretty good at being hypocrites. When you go in the doctor's lounge, you see all you see is bagels and donuts, right? I mean, that's pretty much in coffee and, and uh, the powdered creamer. You think, wow, that's not very good. I mean, we should know better than that, guys. You know? Yeah. It's hard. It's do what I say, not what I do. Okay. Tell us what a direct primary care even is, though. So how is this different from normal medicine? And how do you get away from normal medicine? Because it's super hard when you're, you have to play the game with insurance companies and do all that. Yeah, it's hard. You know, it's it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing because you have to justify everything you do. With direct primary care, basically what is it, you could think of it as like AAA. For me, for instance, AAA, I paid for 35 years. That I've used it like six times in 35 years. But when mm -hmm. I call them, I pick up the phone, they're there, right? Because that's their service. But mm -hmm. the problem we have in medicine these days, it's like if you're AAA and everyone's car breaks down every day, you can't stay in business. You can't survive that, right? So mm -hmm. you're hoping that some people take care of their cars and people who don't hopefully get their cars fixed and they can get on the road and, and you're not towing everyone every day. So in medicine, what's happened, I've noticed everyone's getting sicker and sicker. Why? We're not addressing the root cause of all the problems, which is metabolic disease. So the problem is when I have 15 minute, 15 minute, 15 minute patients back to back to back, as a doc, the only thing I can really do to get through that patient load is to throw more drugs on. Say your blood pressure is high, here's a drug for that. Your sugars are high, here's a drug for that. You're depressed, here's a drug. You're anxious, here's a drug. So we could get them in and out. I could write a script in no time. I could send it electronically now. So the problem I was facing is I, I was saying, gosh, darn it, this guy's pre-diabetic. I know it's a problem. Let me check his insulin. 58. It should be less than five if you're metabolically healthy. So you see this person, you think, uh-oh, if I don't intervene, they're going to be in the ICU getting intravenous insulin at some point because their body cannot handle this much damage. So I think, well, gosh, so I would schedule these people before lunch. So what would happen? I'd work through lunch trying to help this person and probably 80% of the time they don't listen, <laughs> right? Really? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I'm taking time away from my family and my kids uh, because I'm trying to teach someone who doesn't really care. That's when I started realizing there's a problem with this system because Insurance companies don't see the time we invest in education as being valuable. What you and I are doing with our podcast is reaching way more people than I ever could as a physician. That was one thing I realized. It's like, wow, we have people all the time online thanking us. And I see them thanking you for saying, thanks for having that guest that changed my life. Right. It's hard to do that. And, and sometimes when you're their primary care doc, they just don't see it. 
And plus, people don't have a vested interest uh, until it costs them, until it's a problem. One of my patients for two years, I've been warning him he's going to get diabetes. Now, one of his diabetes medicines is $600 a month just for one medicine, right? Mm -hmm. That was preventable. So donuts aren't so cheap. You can get them cheap, but the, the effects are not mm -hmm. cheap, right? Yeah. So it's that effect. He's like, man, I should have listened to you. Now, now he's mad at the cost of all of his medicines. I'm like, this is a reversible disease process. So now we're trying to get him on track. Right. So, so through lifestyle, we can prevent a lot of the costs of medic. Because you look at Medicare, why is Medicare going broke? The biggest cost is diabetes complications. L look at the number one cause of amputation, diabetes, number one cause of dialysis, <laughs> number one cause of blindness, number one cause of cardiovascular disease. All these things are amputation and with foot ulcers. Diabetes is a total disaster. And until we say, OK, what's the root cause? What do we do to prevent this from happening? We catch it early or prevent it before it even happens. Because the other thing people don't realize is once you get diabetes on your medical record, when you go to get life insurance, long-term care, forget it. It's going to be through the roof expensive. So it's a better investment to take care of your health before that happens, right? We can mm -hmm. intervene before it happens. So, and this was the discussion I had right before I, when I, <laughs> when I decided to leave the practice, I was making pretty good money. The head of the HMO, we had a, and, I, and we trained together and we had a meeting and, and he says, Brian, are you having a midlife crisis? Well, how could you be walking away from that money? And I said, look, here's the problem. I just told him I'm the dumbest doctor on earth because I have about 80 patients that I can document. I can show you, you can call, come over and I'll show you on your insurance plan that would have gotten diabetes over the last two years. But through our hard work and the patient's dedication and listening, we prevented it before it happened. So guess what? Those, how much money is you that going to save you down the road? And I get paid less because you don't get, if they yeah. get diabetes, I get paid more. So a lot of doc, and it's not the doc's intention, but they say, well, well, because they don't know this is a preventable. They think it's a chronic progressive disease because that's what we've been taught. Say, oh, bad luck. You got diabetes, poor guy. So now we're going to put you on a bunch of meds, right? <laughs> Instead of saying, okay, let's step back. How do we reverse the ship? How do we intervene? How do we teach you what you're doing isn't working and that you can, can't be eating fruit roll-ups all day and think you're going to you know, reverse this problem? So when people get it, I'll give you an example, a personal example. My neighbor, three days before Memorial Day, I was looking at him thinking, gosh, he doesn't look very good, but he had lost 40 pounds. So I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just cutting back. And he knows I'm a low-carb guy and I don't push my views on people, let him in, you know, but I'm, I'm observing what he's eating and drinking. And, and Arnold Palmer, he's having lemonade and ice, sweetened iced tea all day long. So I'm like, hmm, how do you feel? Because I'm tired all the time and my mouth's dry. I go, let me get my little <laughs> glucometer, check his glucose, mm -hmm. 496. I was Whoa. like, uh-oh, you're in trouble. You got to call your doctor tonight. Well, my doctor's out of town for a week. Who's covering? He doesn't have coverage. What? So let me see your med list. <laughs> I'm going through his meds, trying to help him. And he's on five diabetes meds. Doctor never told me either that or he's in total denial, but I don't think so. He said, oh, these are just for high, you know, pre-diabetes. I'm like, your A1C is 12. That's not pre-diabetes. That's a wow. six and a half is diabetes. Yeah. But you realize what a disaster that is. And so within three weeks, three weeks, we got him on a continuous glucose monitor, took him off five medications, and uh, his sugars are in the 70s and 80s right now. That's awesome. Three weeks of lifestyle. That is it. And it was shocking. It's shocking to me. What was it for? For what? Yeah, 496, 400. the first finger stick. And I almost had a stroke because oh I said, God. you got to go to the ER, man. You got to go. He goes, no, 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 I'm not going. I'll, I'll stop eating sugar. I was like, well, it's not that easy. It's so crazy. People don't even realize they're sucking down sugar nonstop. Or they're like, oh, well, it's just juice. Yeah, I'm just drinking juice. It's like, that is sugar. <laughs> Yeah, people don't realize that. That's high fructose corn syrup in a lot of those things. And you know, he, and the, the crazy thing is, Brian, this was education to me because I go, let me see what you're eating and drinking. I'm going through his food thinking, oh, my gosh, like all this stuff is loaded with sugar. But the shocking one for me was Clamato. Do you know Clamato juice, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it. It's like, it has more sugar than a soda. And he's having that every day yeah. for breakfast thinking, oh, I'm getting my vegetables. So I'm healthy. healthy. I'm like, oh, my. Yeah. It is. Tomatoes, high fructose corn syrup, number two ingredient. I was like, wow, that is stunning. I didn't think that. I'm like, you know, so you start realizing we don't know because it just sounds like it's a healthy thing to do. And then you realize, oh, this isn't very healthy. Wow. That's, yeah, that's bad. And part of the problem too is back up a little bit is the incentives are misaligned for the big hospitals and the doctors and the whole system, right? They, you don't get paid to get people off of medications. You get paid to put them on medications. I bet it's been said a million times on your podcast and my podcast, but why is the system so backwards or what can we do about it? Because it's almost impossible because it's incentives are misaligned. Like how is it possible to work against that? Well, it's really going to come through education. That's what it's going to, Mark Cucuzella, he's a doc and he's done a lot in the hospital saying, you guys put these people in the hospital. I would tease the hospital administration. I said, you guys are like magicians. My patients go in with pre-diabetes and they leave on insulin, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because they put them in, they give them orange juice and, and oatmeal with brown sugar and uh, raisins and all this stuff. 
and their sugars go crazy. And they go, then they put them on a sliding scale to get rid of the sugar. And I go, hey, guys, how about if we just don't give them the sugar? Then we don't need the insulin to get rid of the sugar we're not giving them. And this concept for some reason, because everyone's afraid of low sugars, right? So that's why what we're doing is when we, you can monitor someone's sugar level, I can get a, a, a notification on my phone every time they check their sugars. As a matter of fact, my neighbor just checked his sugar, and I know what his sugar's running right now, right? Mm. I know he's – so if it's starting to run low, I can give him a call and say, hey, what's going on? Or if it runs high, I can intervene and say, hey, why is your sugar crazy? Oh. I decided to have a donut today. Okay, watch it because you don't want to be back where you were. So being able to do that right now, the standard of care is I see my diabetics every three months, right? So what happens between November and, you know, November 1st and February, right? They can get 20, 30 pounds and turn into a total disaster, right? Because the holidays mm -hmm. and no one's monitoring them and they're doing their own thing. And so if someone would have intervened and said, hey, your sugars are going up the last three days. What's going on? Oh, my brother's busy. Let me let me watch it and before it gets to be a disaster. So I think that is what the our standard care just doesn't work. Our team work is not, we don't have a good team. We have a diabetic. We'll say, we'll see in three months. Don't eat sugar. Come back in three months and then they're a train wreck or obesity or whatever it is. And unless we have constant contact with them, it's very difficult to monitor. You can't monitor. You can't. You really can't. But, you know, I could tell you what you know, Brian. What we're talking about with with his advanced monitoring. If I have a 24-hour glucose meter on you, and I have a 24-hour scale, and I have a 24-hour blood pressure cuff, that is like a triple lie detector test, right? It's it's impossible for all those three things to go out of whack without something happening. It could be your stress and not sleeping. It could be your stress and eating terrible food. It could be you stopped exercising. It could be you're not sleeping. All those things. But we have to figure out the problem before it gets out of control. Yeah. So you're talking more about this direct primary care model where we're using wearables and we're using all these things to help actually treat the patient and keep them accountable. Exactly. Exactly. And us building a team, maybe it's psychological stuff going on. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe we need to get counseling. So trying to figure out what makes you binge eat at five o'clock every day. And we could even send a message to our patients say, hey, whoever's binge eating at this time. But the thing is, the technology is incredible. The communication software we have, because as we agree, we we'll say, okay, let's change their lifestyle. So it's cool if, you know, the, the hard thing I find is if you're 500 pounds, it's embarrassing to go to the gym. But guess what? Once I have four other people that are 500 pounds in my practice and say, let's start off, we'll go for a walk. And you know what? Doc will join us and we'll talk about whatever we want to talk about. It's an hour of my time and I need the exercise anyway. So I can walk with these people or my partner or my staff and we can build a community. And then these guys talk and say, hey, you know what I did? I used to be 600 pounds. Guess what I did? I'm doing this. When I crave this, here's what I did. And these people can help you. They're, they're more of an expert at weight loss than I am, right? Because they're living it too. So those things, when you can have the, the power of community, that's important, right? I have a friend who's like, okay, we're doing our plank challenge. Did you do your say? Oh man, I got to go do it. I'll do it. I forgot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go do it right now. So those kind of things, when you have someone who, when those days when you don't want to do it, they say, we're going to be there. We'll meet you there. And you go, ah, uh, I'll go. Okay. So that kind of a positive peer pressure is very good for people. For a lot of us, it keeps us on track. And so when you have like-minded people and you see them succeeding and you're succeeding, it, it's a positivity that, that spreads, right? And that's what we're looking at. And we're saying, how, I, I was saying, how do I make a community? Uh, it's hard when you're working 14 hour days and you don't have any free time to, to help people. You're mm -hmm. stuck in a, a little room. But say, hey, I'm not billing for this visit and there's no copay. So if I want to take a, a walk with you around the, the neighborhood, let's go for a walk outside and talk, get a little vitamin D and, and enjoy each other's company and get out of that clinical environment. Uh, a lot of docs, we sit in there. I mean, I've seriously, I, so many days in the, over the last 17 years, I've, I've been there at dark and left at dark. You know, I don't see the mm -hmm. light of day at all. And I'm telling people, okay, if it's stressful, don't do it. Well, why am I doing it, right? Get some yeah. more sleep. Okay, I'm sleeping five hours at night. Uh, that's not very good, right? So you start realizing, let me reassess this and say, is it worth it? Did we go into medicine to make a lot of money or did we go in to help people? And that's what I had to reassess ultimately. You know, my epiphany was around the time when Kobe Bryant died. And I was thinking, you know what? This guy would have given up everything to have one more day with his wife and kids. He would have given up all of his money. So am I willing to do that for down the road? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because you realize what's important in life at some point, you know, and it's not saying, mm -hmm. okay, how many hours can I work and how many, how much can I complain about the system? You say, well, if the system's broken, either I try to fix the system or you say, let me make the system better. Yeah, you go around it and do it a different way. Well, that's what I was going to get to is you have to go outside the system. The, the system, the incentives are misaligned. They're entrenched in old beliefs. They're giving people with sugar problems sugar. It's a nightmare. So I don't know if anyone <laughs> can change the system. So I guess you have to go around it. So that's the direct primary care. That's when we're, you're not being, say, charged by the hour. Where there's different 
versions of direct primary care, but maybe we can talk more about the different versions or what else we can do because you're not being, like you said, you can go on walks with the patients or that maybe they pay the monthly fee. I, I've heard versions of that, or maybe you pay, there's different ways to do it. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So say you pay a hundred bucks a month, right? That's your, that's your plan. And you come in five times that month, you don't get any, uh, there's no copays or anything like that. You know, stuff in the office we could do like EKGs and respiratory treatments, all that stuff we just kind of absorb. But what you have is access to your doctor. The problem is for the last 17 years, I, you know, I had, when I was leaving my practice, I had 2,200 patients, right? 2,200 patients. Mm. No one could, my metabolic health people, the ones who really sought me out for helping them with their diabetes and obesity, I couldn't get them in because I was too busy. I had nowhere to put them. So my office would tell him, no, he, he's not taking new patients, right? Because I had no t- place to put in. And I'm complaining because I look, look, I'm working 14 hour days, guys. This isn't very cool, right? I want to go home and see my wife and kids too. So it's one of those things where you start realizing now I'll have say 250 patients, right? 250 mm-hmm. is a lot better than 2200. So those people, so instead of doing five physicals a day, back to back, having 15 minute appointments, I'll never have a 15 minute appointment in my new practice. It'll be half an hour at least. New patients, an hour, hour and a half, whatever it takes. If I have time, I'll sit there with you because that's what I do because I know it's an upfront investment, right? So it's upfront for me to say, hey, look, let me get you on the right path. If you're invested, problem is a lot of people really don't care and they're not invested, right? They go, yeah, I know Mm -hmm. smoking two packs a day isn't good for me, but I'm going to keep doing it. So do you harass them every time they come in or just say, hey, when you're ready to quit, let me support you in that, right? So so people who do direct primary care, what I'm finding are people that are very invested in their health. They say, look, help me out. I want to do what's right. I'm, I'm paying you as the, like if I want to get my, you know, room put on my house, I don't get the cheapest guy who's never done it before. I get someone who's done it day in and day out. They go, yeah, I've seen all these problems, no problem. We can take care of it, right? So you, at some point you pay for the experience and you're paying for access, meaning, Hey, if you if you're having a problem and you need to see me, I'll get you in that day. I'll have openings for you. Right now, I mean, where I was, I was booked out six months for physicals. Right, so if someone mm-hmm. called now, I can't get them in for six months for a physical because there's only one of me and I have 2,200 patients. So when you n- narrow that down, now you can spend more time with each patient and really educate. Plus, the great thing is, <laughs> I'm in a very fortunate area where I'm at is that I can do group meetings. I can I can give a lecture on diabetes to 500 people. Oh, with COVID, it makes it a little bit more challenging, but but yeah. we could do it to 50 people. Even if I can get 12 people at a time, that saves me 11 hours because my hour is the same, but I can have 12 people that I can say, hey, let me explain this, how metabolic disease works. So when I educate that person, now it's on them. I've told them, look, here's how it works. And then they could make choices if they can't give up cookies and donuts. If my patient couldn't have or my neighbor couldn't have given up his stuff, then he would be on insulin. And he'd be his whole life would be different. I look at him now, and he's bubbly and and bright. And he thought he was getting demented because he, he said he couldn't remember anything. He was slow. His body hurt. Now he's out <laughs> doing stuff, visiting with neighbors, out walking. And so when you see that, you think, wow, that's that's valuable. Like to us docs, when you see people getting better, that is so much fun. It's like it's not work. Mm-hmm. You know, Brian, what you guys are seeing, what you're doing over there, it's like. You know, with Sapien and, and what you're doing, seeing people that are saying, wow, I can go for hikes now. I couldn't go hiking before. I couldn't even get out of my house, you know? So that's what's exciting about it. Yeah. Well, that's because we you turn the incentives around. If you do well and you do have patient success and they tell their friends and so you, you feel good about having that patient, but you're also aligning your financial incentives because that patient will continue with you and keep paying and their friends and family to come see you and you can... So it's the opposite type of system where you're being kind of paid to keep people healthy. Well, it's the system of of AAA. If I'm a AAA uh, owner, I say, okay, look, what I have to do is I want a lot of people who have brand new cars because guess what? They're not going to call me. If people are healthy and fit and they remain that way, great. But I I have the time now to tow the cars that are broken down and get them out of harm's way because I, I have the resources. Now I can do that. So our hope is we say, okay, look, your car's messed up. Here's what we got to do. Change this, change this, change this. Let's get this done. And then their car's running fine. So guess what? I don't have to tow them all the time. So I have people yeah. that are coming in all the time because they're sick and you know, every time they come in, they're, they're paying a copay. This time it's like, hey, every time they come in, that's my time. So what's my incentive is to keep you as healthy as I can. That's the joke I tell my patients. Like the healthier you are and the longer you live, the more money I make and the better my life is. Because if you're healthy, you're never going to have to bug me, right? I can go home early that day. But if you're sick, I want to help you. And that's what I'm designed to do. That's what I'm called to do. That's where I get my reward, right? So it's like when you see someone who can't drive their car, then all of a sudden they're, you know, they're able to drive around the country and they say, wow, this is great. I had a place in that. I had a part in that. And that's what we're doing. That's why we have that reward. That's what you're seeing. 
you know, is that people are getting better and healthier and they love to see you and they go, hey, doc, do you see my weight? Hey, do you see my sugars? Because they're excited. Before they were hiding and they didn't want you to see it because they're ashamed. Now they're saying, hey, did you see this? You better notice that. I worked hard for that, you know? And so they have a sense of accomplishment and, and that's what we want to be a part of. I love that. I just want to reiterate that because no, 99% of the world has never heard of this or done this. And it makes a lot of sense. You are rewarded as a doctor. You have more free time to help other people if you are not helping someone, if they are healthy. And so that is the correct incentives. That makes sense. I mean, you should try to do this in all areas of your life is, you know what I mean? There's so many things you go to mechanic. I always feel like I'm getting ripped off because of course they're making more money, the more problems I have. So I don't want to go to that mechanic or like even a vet. I go, I feel, I just took my dog to the vet. I feel like I got so ripped off because they're just like, oh, uh, you know, here's 12 things. I'm like, I, I don't even know what just happened. You just like listed a bunch of procedures and I didn't need to go in because of COVID. And I'm sitting in my car by myself, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. frustrating. That's the thing is that that is the bottom line. It's like, okay, if I, if I have to pay for your car repairs, I'd rather catch those things early. Say, oh, that hose is going to break on your long trip. Why don't we replace that now? Instead of blowing up your whole radiator and transmission and all that stuff. So it's one of those things. W- w- the problem with Western medicine is exactly that, is that we wait till you blow up your engine. Go, yeah, you blow up your engine. We have to do a bypass surgery. Well, what could we have done to prevent that 10 years ago? Once it happens, it happens. Like diabetic mm-hmm. neuropathy and all these complications. You don't know which you're blind and you get a leg amputated and all this stuff. And this is what we see day in and day out. That's why doctors are burned out. I'm convinced of that. When you see your patients getting worse and worse and worse and you're helpless, you keep throwing more drugs on, you can't, you know, it's just a non-ending cycle. But when you get someone who's invested and they go, okay, look, I want to make my life better. It makes a huge difference. It's one of those things where we never know that they were going to blow up their engine, but they were Mm -hmm. on the road. We can look at their lab and say, you're in trouble. I, as a matter of fact, Brian, this is just, I'm just saying in the last three years, I've had exactly zero patients get diabetes that I didn't warn them at least six months in advance because mm-hmm. we could tell when that, when they're filling up their, their stores of sugar, we could tell when it's going to be a problem based on their numbers. Like you said, the, the CRP, you see the, the liver test going up and all this stuff that these are all signs of damage being done. So I want the mechanic who's not the best at changing the engine. I want the best, the one who changes the least engines because they say, okay, let's prevent this from happening. You know, I love a mechanic like that that says, hey, here's what you do. Your car will run forever. Just change your oil every so often and you have to change your spark plugs and make sure you change this this filter, right? Instead of waiting until it blows up everything. So that's what we're talking about. That's the type of medicine we're talking about is not being the heroic stuff where we're doing CPR and, and uh, you know, shocking your heart back. Let's prevent it from getting to that point. People say, what are we going to do about this? trillion dollar healthcare system, all this stuff, it's prevention. That's the only way to do it. Like we're spending all our money on these crazy procedures and not preventing them. And then even the people, I know there's some organizations that try to focus on prevention, but they're just, again, misguided, right? They'll just try to recommend a low fat diet and counting calories and stuff like that. So even the people who are trying to do it aren't even on the right page. Well, and that's the hard thing is you look and you say, okay, let's see who's sponsoring this organization who's supposed to be on my acting on my behalf right and when you look at the sponsorships you shake your head and think you've got to be kidding me on the conflict of interest you know just recently we've seen some of our big medical journals publishing absolute garbage studies that were not true and they were pushing an agenda so when you see that you think well where's the integrity here where is the concern about your fellow man that you want to do the right thing i think so many people are disillusioned because most of the time to be honest the frontline docs are just trying to survive in their mind i get it i, I don't get frustrated with people because i get it they're saying this is the next uh, hype fad thing that goes through and it's going to be gone like the grapefruit diet or whatever you know they see and they just go i'm not learning about this, this is stupid i don't have time I'm, I'm exhausted. You're, you're talking about yeah. like keto and low carb right yeah yeah keto is low carb right? carnivore and they go that's crazy uh, yeah, mm-hmm. but i'll just ignore it i'm not going to learn about it to see if it's crazy and see what's what the clinical mm-hmm. results are they know what they were taught in med school, so they're just sticking with it. But when you look around and say, well, everyone's gotten really sick since we got out of med school. We have a vast epidemic of diabetes, obesity, cardiac disease. And you say, well, what do we do about it? It's not working. It's just like anything. You know, I've kind of made that joke a lot of times about like uh, if you if I keep give, if you come to me sick all the time, I keep giving you the antibiotic and you're not getting better. You're like, doc, you keep giving me the same antibiotic. It's just like mm-hmm. saying exercise more and eat less. It's the same antibiotic I'm giving you. I have to be an idiot at some point because it's not working for you. So how do we get to that patient? How do we reach them? How do we, you know, spend time with them to get to know them? You know, and, and I, a lot of the time, like, you know, Tro's data is showing that most of the time when people fall off the wagon with diabetes or obesity, it's stress or lack of family support. Those mm-hmm. are two massive things we got to look at. Like, how's your support at home? Because if they have terrible support and everyone's eating cookies and donuts and they're trying to, you know, be good and, and they have an addiction to food, guess what? It's going to be a problem. 
right? You need that support. Just like trying to quit drinking and all your friends, you're at the bar every day. It's going to be a trouble for you. It's not going to be very easy to do it that way. But if you change what you're doing, go hiking with your friends every day, then that might be helping you get through this. Well, it sounds like it's a psychological part might be the hardest. Is that what you see in your practice and with Tro and all that? It's a psychological component? Well, you know, it's one of those things. I think that's a huge part of it for sure. I think what happens is we go back to our own coping mechanism. So you can get counseling and then you get into a fight and you go back and start screaming at people when they told you to be calm and peaceful because you just go back to that basic animal instinct a lot of times. So it's interesting. I think that's a majority of it. But, you know, we just did an interview with Ken Armstrong, who's a fantastic guy who's lost like 300 pounds, I think. And, and But he lost a bunch of weight. And then one day he said, you know, he's doing great, not stressed. Everything's fine in his life. And he said, I feel like having a cookie today. He had one cookie. Six months later, he's gained 60 pounds back. Because mm-hmm. it wasn't that he was stressed. It wasn't that he was depressed. He said, I feel like having a cookie. So in his case, that's more of an ad- addiction, right? An addiction issue. He goes, I- I'm addicted to this. It's, like, it's just like someone could be in, off alcohol for two years and all of a sudden they have one drink in the streets in a week, right? They're mm-hmm. a total disaster. So it's one of those things. You have to realize who it is. Is it generalizable to everyone? No. Some people can say, I'll have one drink and that's it. I'm not going to have a drink again and they do fine and others have one drink and they get upset and want to drink the whole case right mm-hmm. get out leave mm-hmm. me alone i know what i'm doing and, and they lose their judgment and that happens you know rob sivis taught me a lot about that and and we have to realize that as a true phenomenon that those of us who are doing this kind of medicine we see it no doubt about it so people always talk about no one size fits all diet and it's like personalized but it's kind of like personalized care in general is that you have to personalize all more psychologically personalize it to their habits and their personality. Correct. It's not a one size fits all. That is the huge take home. That is doing this podcast. That's the one thing we come up with and go, okay, is it one size fits all? Okay, Brian, what works for you today may not work for you next week. It may not. We may have to make some adjustments depending on stress levels in life and all that. So for instance, my neighbor, I go, look, he was, I can never have a soda again. I was like, well, I would prefer you never have one in your life, but right now it will kill you if you do. Maybe in a year, if you had one, it'll give you a blip on your sugar reading and then you get off it. But once we have mm-hmm. one and then you went 30. So it's one of those things. It's it, it, the physiology changes. As a matter of fact, we just interviewed a guy, same thing. He's lost 80 pounds, low carb keto. And he goes, yeah, I have rice. He's, he's Asian. He goes, I have rice sometimes. And I have this and he does. And he goes, my numbers are good. And, and my, I'm not getting weight. And I feel great because now he's metabolically healthy. And now he has places if he eats some extra sugar. He, he stores it and then he burns it off and then stores it. And he works out a lot. And he's mm-hmm. metabolically healthy. So I think a guy like you, who's fit and thin and trim and muscular, you can get away with a lot more because those carbs you eat are going to go to your muscle stores first because your body wants to survive, right? So mm-hmm. it's going to throw it into your glycogen stores and your muscles first. Other people who have no muscle mass, where do they put it? They have to stick it in their liver and fat stores. So they can get metabolically sicker and sicker. And that ball, it, they're at maximum, like you said, the personal fat threshold, right? It depends where you're at and where you are in the journey. So some people can get away with more. Like like Sean Baker, like this guy has so much muscle mass. If he wanted to liberalize his carb intake, he would do fine. But he's a carnivore, mm-hmm. so he doesn't need a lot of carbs. Mm-hmm. So, But if he did, he'd probably be fine compared to the rest of us for a, a time being. Then he'd maybe start gaining weight. Then he'd say, okay, I'm going back to carnivore. You know, it's, it's, it's adjusting. So I have some people who've done – who do keto on the during the week and the weekends they do whatever they want and their weight's been stable for five years. You know, it's working for them. I'm not going to argue with them. Say if that's your lifestyle, it's working, you know. So it's really individualized, like you said, Brian. Yeah, context. So yeah, with the food, there's always a context. Yeah, people are like, well, what's your goals? What's the context? Can you get carbs aren't necessarily bad, but they could be bad, <laughs> depending on the context. And then there's the psychological side. And that's really interesting too, is that some patients can do moderation and some can't. Yeah, like if you're talking about drinking, yeah, some people need to have abstinence from drinking. And some people, they're like, hey, I was sober for a few years and now I can have a couple glasses of wine on a Saturday night and I can do it, right? And some people can do it, some people can't. So that's super important to get into. And then also this moderation thing. I was just talking to uh, Food Lies. <laughs> I'll get into Food Lies for a second. I talk to my director, editor every day. We have our standing three o'clock meeting. And so just want to let everyone know it is happening taking forever. We're trying to make this thing really special. We could have done a film and got it out last year and it would have been fine. It would have been good. It would have been okay. But we kind of switched gears. I got a new director, editor, a guy I grew up with who's amazing. And we decided we're going to make this thing amazing. The best thing possible. We're going to go over every single minute. I'm going to Africa soon. Like We're doing all the things to make this special. Every minute is going to count. We're going over every graphic. We're reshooting things. We're getting new people and that's why it's taking forever, but it's going to be worth it. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm excited about that. And we'll help out however we can to get the word out because I know it's going to be amazing. It's needed. Yeah. It's so needed. And, you know, there are other films that have come out like Fat Fiction. 
but they, I mean, they haven't made it in the mainstream, you know, like I really want to get this in the main mainstream, like Netflix, millions of people watching it. Everyone's talking about it like the stupid game changers film. So that's our goal. That's why it's taking a while. But today we're talking about moderation. And I think that's a huge problem with the world with food is people say you can eat anything in moderation. And there is a little bit of truth to it. That's why it's so hard to figure this stuff out because some people can do it and some people can't. Or maybe the bigger issue is what moderation is. It's kind of a stupid nebulous term in a way too. Is people, we're talking about never having a soda again. I, I don't want to do keto. I'm, I, what am I, never going to have a piece of cake again? I can't have like a piece of wedding cake at my daughter's wedding, you know? No, that's not what we're saying. In the past, even 50 years ago, you went to McDonald's once a month. It was a big treat. Or even, okay, think about hunter-gatherers. It's not like they had a pot of honey every day. It was this big fine. They got a big pot of honey. That's fine. But when people these days think about moderation or they think about treats, or the, they're talking about like three times a day. And they think that that's, it's like okay to eat dessert every single day and then or eat an egg or waffle every single morning. There is such a big difference between those two things I just laid out. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's a, the fact that that's a big thing, you know, uh, like the weightlifter guys, they look and they go, oh, look, I have pop tarts every day and I'm fine. Look at me. Well, because you're metabolically healthy, you can get away with it more. But my diabetic patient cannot do that. So if you're telling them, yeah, you got a pop tart, you could do it doesn't work for them. If your sugar is 500 and you're 300 pounds, it doesn't work for you. It's not working. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work for you down down the road. That's what my patient, that's one of the big questions. Everyone said, I can never have bread again. I can never have pizza again. It's like, you know, I have pizza once every six weeks with my neighbors, right? I might have one piece and a big huge salad and it's a social thing. But I don't go off the wire. That's just like I do it. I don't feel bad. And it's, you know, every once in a while. So it's, it's one of those things. I think we get so pigeonholed into what we're doing. And so people will ask me, you you never eat bread. Oh, a perfect example. When I go to Guatemala, I do a medical trip and I'm I'm dealing with the worst diabetes, like sugar out of control. And guess who got to them first? Soda. They're drinking sodas and their sugar's 400. I'm trying to help them and say, you're shooting insulin to get rid of the soda you're drinking. And they say, well, they told me I need it for energy. Well, you don't need it for energy. It's killing you. Right. (laughs) So you get into this topic. So I'm doing this all day long. And so we go to this lady's house and she makes us dinner and it's beautiful, ha- homemade. Everything's wonderful. And she's very cordial. And she hands me a tortilla and everyone looked at me like 15 people <laughs> looked at me like, you're not going to eat that. Right. I'm like, you know what, guys, look, I haven't had a tortilla in about eight months. This lady handmade it. So I'm not going to be so rude as if it's poison that I can't have one tortilla. Right. I've worked all day. I, I fasted all day. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to have 30 tortillas. I'll have one. So with that, you know, so I tell my patients, look, like people say, I can never have sourdough. I love sourdough bread. It's like, hey, you know what? They're like, do you have bread? I go, look, if I go to the nicest restaurant in the world, I will. But if it's Weber's bread or some kind of off the, uh, there's no, I'm never eating that again. It's not worth it to me, right? Yeah. But you know what? More and more, I just never have, you know, my kryptonite was chips and salsa and tortillas, right? You know, hang, hanging out in Latin America a lot. So now it's like, you know, I'll have the carne asada and an avocado and and I'm good. I don't need the tortilla anymore. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a normal not to do it. But, you know, when people say you can never do it again, that's the one thing you're going to think about all the time. So this moderation thing is really a tough one because by the same token, if someone came to your house and they're alcoholic, you wouldn't say, oh, just have a little drink. Come on. It's, it's old mm-hmm. times. Let's have one drink. You, would, you wouldn't do it out of respect. But someone who's 350 pounds, who's just lost 80 pounds, will come over for Thanksgiving. Just have one bite of cake, right? Just have one. Mm-hmm. Just just be social. Like the person doesn't want it and they're doing fine. So you wouldn't do that with an alcoholic, but you would do it with someone who struggles with sugar addiction, right? So it's it's one of those things because we, we look at it differently. We don't understand the gravity of that, of what you're doing to someone by saying everything in moderation. When someone can't, like you said, if someone can't be moderate, then you don't say moderation because that's out of their wheelhouse. It's they can't them. be moderate. It's not them. And and the big key for all of us is saying, am I, am I that person or not? Am I the person who could have one glass of wine and be fine? Or do I have to have 14 glasses of wine when I have one? But then you do, you say, okay, I got to make some changes. Uh, it's not a judgment. It's what you, what it is. It's just the fact of it, you know? So I think that's what we're learning from people. Some people just kill it and they do great. And Ken, again, he lost all that weight, gained back 60. Then he got his act back together. And he's like, it's not worth it. I'm not even thinking about it now. I'm done. Right. So he saw that he's a redemption and a disaster and a redemption again. Right. We could all do that. And it's life. You know, if people are going to have life stress and then you say, well, I'm stressed. Why do I want a cookie when I'm stressed? You know, think about that. Replacing that with something positive. So I think that's part of what we do, Brian, is trying to help people to say, how do we help you? What works for you? Because that's the thing is, is um, 
there's so many great I, I just had tony hampton on I, I don't know if you're familiar with him really great mm -hmm. guy in uh he's african-american doc who's one of the smartest guys around and he's in chicago and he said he was vegan for a long time he's trying to get his people to be vegan and the african-american community is like like no one followed him like two people mm -hmm. in his whole in eight years two people followed him then uh -huh. he's like oh now he's low carb keto guy and he goes uh hey you could have ribs but just stay away from the sauce here we're gonna make macaroni and, cheese. and he's doing great things in the community why he goes to the store and he goes how come you don't have any um broccoli or cauliflower and they said no one buys it he goes okay i'm gonna educate my people to buy it will you stock it okay so he's gonna teach them how to make now mm. they're making macaroni and cheese with, with instead of macaroni they're using cauliflower, cauliflower. and that's good. people are happy and he, they're killing it they're coming off diabetes medicine he's doing a great job and he's a huge impact on his community right uh we have ariel ortiz and and um christian Assad, and they're doing a spanish language podcast right and they're reaching the community saying look this substitute this and they they understand the culture and they understand the humor and they understand how to talk to people in that culture so they could do way more than you and i can brian so we all have our role you know, we all have our role and people are going to reach each other in different ways. But I think what we can do is really all of us are attacking that that big problem we're seeing is, look, we're, we're metabolically sick. That's mm -hmm. why COVID's an issue, right? Because we're metabolically sick and we're not a good host for this thing. A healthy guy like you, if you got COVID, I wouldn't be worried about you. So keep an eye on you. And, you know, I'm trying you? to get COVID. I don't even care. <laughs> Give it to me. Bring it on. I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah, stay healthy, man. But, you know, I mean, it's the same thing. You say, hey, I want to be the best host. I, the worst thing you could do is lock someone up in their house, make them stressed, make them eat terrible food, make them not sleep, make them watch the news over and over, right? They're not getting their vitamin D. They're not. And then you're going to send them out into the environment at some point, right? I'd rather say, hey, let's work out. Let's watch ourselves. Go lay by your pool for a few minutes a day, 15 minutes or so, and, you know, enjoy life, laugh, don't be stressed out, you know, because life will get back. So, you know, that's my big concerns. Like people um, are turning back to their bad stuff. You know, you may have just saw the article today about all these big, terrible foods are, are making a huge comeback because people are stressed and what they do, they're turning to Comfort these kind food. of foods, comfort foods, right? Yeah, so let's, no, the media is pushing that, that stuff too. Exactly too, exactly right, yeah. And Postmates is pushing it too. I didn't even use Postmates. I'm not even, I make my own food, but somehow I signed up for Postmates however many years ago. And every day I get, get your food, get your comfort food, free delivery on this, free delivery on that. I mean, it's no wonder people are having a hard time in this lockdown. With, yeah, I mean, I've seen it. I've known so many people that have gone off the wagon, stopped working out, gaining weight, all this type of stuff. It's not great. Yeah, it's not good for metabolic disease. And that's the thing. That's what we're seeing is, you know, so I'm trying to bring this to the direct primary care. Direct primary care hasn't traditionally been doing low carb keto and all this kind of stuff. They've been more, uh, you know, just having more access to your docs. But this combination is outstanding. When you have more time to educate, we could really make an impact, you know, doing town halls. We've learned a lot. COVID has been a good thing in a way where we've learned a lot. How do I reach more people to give them a message, right? Your podcast will reach a lot more people than I ever could in my office. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's it. And so, so really what we are all doing is attracting people who care about their health and say, look, I don't want to be a statistic. I want to be able to be 80 years old and, and enjoy life and be out hiking and doing stuff, not sitting in, in a room looking at a wall because I'm, I can't think for myself or I can't get out off the chair, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, this is great. So just, yeah, I want to circle back on some of these things. We're talking about reaching our community, educating the community, you know, finding what's going to work for them. That's the magic sauce. You're talking about all the different people in the different communities, African-American or Latin. It's reaching them where they're at, educating them and making it work within their lifestyle. And before what we're talking about is work in your lifestyle. If you are someone who can have a piece of bread once a month, then have that bread once a month or abstain from it. You have to figure it out how to fit it in your lifestyle. And also talking about moderation, there's a difference. The problem with the moderation I was trying to get at was they think to me and you, moderation is once a month, once every six weeks, you can have some pizza. For me, what works for me is once a week. I can have pizza with my friends once a week and be fine because I'm metabolically healthy and I work out a lot and this is what works for me. But other people's definition of moderation is twice a day. So I'm trying to tie everything together here, but it's kind of just people need to have context, nuance. You need to know what works for you. You need to know what kind of person you are. You need to understand how it fits into your lifestyle. And yeah, I guess that's what our goal is in general with say direct primary care or in the low carb world or in just in this educational community where in the nutrition space is letting people understand how to make this work within their lifestyle. Exactly. And change and, and figuring out, hey, when you lose 60 pounds, guess what? I hear it all the time. People love to exercise. They enjoy it. They go, I enjoy it now. I'm not hurting and struggling for 
air when I move. And when their joints don't hurt anymore, they feel better. And you decrease inflammation in your diet, the joints feel better. So I've seen miracles. You think, wow, this is crazy stuff. It's unbelievable. But that's the truth. There's people who would never think about doing time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting. Now all of a sudden they go, oh, I didn't eat lunch today. I didn't even think about it, right? It was no big deal. It wasn't this emotional, big emotional thing. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, I skipped breakfast. So it's just figuring out what works for that person. I think that's what we have to do is this an N of one. I love that you know, what works for you, right? Because if you mm -hmm. hate riding your bike and I tell you to ride your bike every day and you're miserable, that's not going to work. Figure out what exercise you enjoy doing, what activities you like working in the yard. What, how do we start this thing? And I think so many of us have looked at it that from that. Now, someone who's in a disaster situation, that's when you say, okay, look, this is hardcore for you. You're in a made like you're about to blow up your engine. Mm -hmm. A guy like us, maybe you know, you you don't even need a tune up, right? I need a tune up, right? Because I'm in that that far down the road trying to catch up with you. So then you say, okay, if you're in major disaster, you know, moderation doesn't work when your sugar's 500. <laughs> it doesn't work. You gotta have you gotta have abstinence from sugar because you're you're overflowing. You can't put any more in your system right now, right? But over time, you, those things change. So I, I think it's just looking at each individual, saying, okay, what works for you? If you hate meat, I'm not going to tell you to be a carnivore. Right. If you eat fish, I'm not going to tell you to be pescatarian. So it's like saying, well, okay, what works? What do you enjoy? That's why, Brian, and, and I think you probably see this. People will come in and go, okay, give me a food plan. What do you like? <laughs> what do you enjoy? What, I don't want to yeah. just give you a food plan. Go on diet doctor and say, hey, this looks good. This looks good. And and I, what I find is, you know, like, like uh, Dr. Hampton was saying, look. Have a meat and some vegetables, right? Have, pick a meat and a couple, have 12 vegetables you like and that are non-starchy and have that. Enjoy. You could change it up, but you don't have to make it this complicated. Like people make it so complicated where it's like the people who do great are ones who are simple. They say, oh, I'll cook a, a steak or I'll have some salmon and I'll have some broccoli with that's that it. or whatever, yeah. right? Or I'll just eat steak. And that's like the carnivores just say that's easy. They just cook a bunch of meat and have it for the week and they never get surprised. And and so a lot of that is they, they do well too because of the the whole mindset of, okay, I'm not, it's not an option for me to have a keto cookie or a regular cookie or like they said, that's not meat. I'm not having it. So it limits a lot of their their temptations too, right? And, and they're focused and they're determined. So, and I think there's a lot of this stuff we're going to find out with, with anxiety, depression, stress levels and all that, how much our diet affects that. You know? Yeah. Oh, that, that leads to, I want to talk about the technology stuff and the wearables, because that's what we're starting to get into and tracking that stuff. And if you have an aura ring or you have all these different things, you can see how the, your diet and lifestyle affects you in real time. You can see how your sleep's affected. Like I notice these things now that I'm, I was never into tons of wearables and maybe I'm not going to ever use them that much, but I, you know, I tried a CGM to learn and then now I can go on from there once I've learned that. And, and it is interesting to know, like, yeah, if you go crazy with, you know, a certain thing, over, it affects you days later. Yeah. If you want to eat like a whole bunch of trash and go on vacation, it's fine. But I mean, it's, it's interesting to know that three days later, you're still seeing those ill effects. So yeah, I want to talk about the technology side and and what you're you guys are using because we're we're still doing the sapien technology. I've been talking about this for like a year, and we had some development problems, but we're we're getting back on track. Actually, we actually need a React Native developer. If anyone wants to uh, reach out to me, we need some programming help with React Native, and you know, we're working with a CGM company, and we're doing some interesting stuff. So we're doing with sapien. We're trying to get this all into one app and one platform, but are you guys using something now, like an HR or medical record system? How yeah, are you Tro getting tech? Yeah, Tro's the brain behind all this stuff. So, you know, he's been playing with it. So I had the the option of being the old guy who learned from the, the young pup who's been doing this. Mm -hmm. So I go, hey, what's the technology? So we have it. our EMR, electronic medical record is, is uh, it can take in data from Apple Health and from uh, like Android Health stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So we can get sleep, we can get step counts, we can get, like I said, 24 hour um, glucose monitor if we want that. That doesn't come directly to the EMR, but we, I can get that on my phone or my, uh, I can get it online. Uh, so we can see, we can look at trends, we can figure out stuff. And one of the things I, I, I'm really, really toying with, and maybe you steer me another way, but there's a scale that does, um, it's 98% accurate with DEXA scan, right? Body fat uh, analysis. Mm. It tons of stuff. It gives you a basal metabolic rate and all that. So we could tweak that. I, I love that as an instrument to say, okay, let's tweak. And it, and it goes electronically to my medical records and to patient's house, whatever. So the patient is looking at the scale and getting frustrated because they're not seeing their numbers going down or even going up. If I work out really hard, my weight will go up. I'm like, what the heck? But you know, you're, you're retaining fluid in your muscles and all that. 
So having a tool where we can say, okay, let's add in some intermittent fasting. We can see what your metabolic rate is doing, what your fat percentage is doing. So we could really help people stay on track, say, look, you've only lost two pounds, but guess what? Look how much metabolically healthy you are. Look what your metabolic rate is doing by putting on muscle mass and all that. And, and so that is a great tool. And I, I like the idea of that to say, okay, let's put in intermittent fasting. And from a research standpoint to say, okay, let's do intermittent fasting or fasting every other day. Let's look at your metabolic rate. Uh, someone who's impressed me was Kirsty Woods. She's, she does metabolic rate on all of her patients. And it's incredible. Like she, they'll be following their metabolic rate and all of a sudden it drops. And they, they'll, she goes, it's one of two things. They're either stressed or they're stress eating. <laughs> they're not sleeping or they're stress eating. That's what does that. Or they're not exercising. So you know, with that, they can intervene right away and say, okay, your metabolic rate is going down when we're cutting your calories. Let's go up on your calories a little bit and see what happens. Let's, let's make adjustments real time. And so there's a lot of value to that. Those darn things are expensive, but I think it's a cool piece of equipment to have if you're really trying to help people with obesity and diabetes and all that. But, but I think, you know, the, the bottom line is having the 24 hour glucose monitors and, and scale and blood pressure is very helpful because that gives us the, the ability to take people off of meds. And that's our goal is let's get you off meds. Let's do that. But we have to do it safely. We don't want you to get low sugars and, and tank out. Right. Yeah. So really it's the safest way to do it. There's no safe way to say, okay, taper your, your insulin over the next three months and we'll see in three months. Like, how do you do that? They don't know what their sugars are. They're not checking them. They don't know what it's doing in the middle of the night, but, but having that continuous monitoring is very, very helpful for us. Right. So I think that technology is the missing key for a lot of practices. And it's hard to do. If I have 2000 patients, how in the heck can I monitor them? But if I have 30 people doing metabolic weight loss, then I can monitor them pretty closely. It's not labor intensive. Right. So, and then we could, we can intervene and say, Oh, your sugars went crazy. As a matter of fact, my neighbor, when his sugars bounce, one day I called him and say, what the heck did you do? He said, I had an apple. Okay. Mm. Now you know what the apple does to you, right? He goes, yeah, exactly. when I have a, when I have certain things, I mean, one day he called me, he's like, oh, hi, I tricked you. I said, what? He goes, I had fried chicken and nothing happened. Okay. And nothing happened. That doesn't mean it's healthy for you, but that's interesting <laughs> data to know. And, and so we'll see if that was just a fluke or what. So anyways, that kind of stuff, again, you got to live your life, but sometimes being able to monitor and catch stuff. Imagine if you had a tool, and this this is how I'll apply it to what we're talking about. If I had something that as soon as you took your first, if you're an alcoholic, the first time you took a drink of alcohol, boom, I get a text on my phone that says, uh-oh, Brian's in trouble. Let me give him a call. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brian, right? So that's the same thing we could do with sugars and weights and blood pressure and all that. If I see your blood pressure spiking, all of a sudden say, what's going on? Oh, I'm stressed. Out. I'm fighting with my wife. I'm eating cookies. I got. So then we could intervene and say, okay, how can we better handle this situation, right? Or having a health coach or someone who can intervene. It doesn't have to be the doctor, of course. But, uh, you know, if we do that and keep you on track with exercise and, you know, there's so much stuff we can do and, and the technology we have is, is unbelievable. But really, it's going to, it comes down to human connection. By saying, hey, I believe in you. Let's do this thing together, right? Having someone who's in your corner when you're trying to do this stuff. Because it's stressful. It's scary, you know, for a lot of people. Yeah. So we're talking about the future of medicine. This is, we're finally getting to the whole thing here is it's a human connection. It's using a collaborative model, like health coaches. We're using technology. We're using direct primary care where our incentives are aligned. This is it. Like, this is the future of health. It's almost like from a sci-fi film where, you know, it's like, oh, wow, you have all this you know, you can see what you eat and you can know what it does to you and all that. And we, we can do that now. So the blood pressure monitor is great. The smart scale is great. CGM. The health coaches is huge too. We're developing our health coach network still. You can still put in your name on sapien.org. We have a whole list of health coaches ready to go. So I think that's big. And I'd love to start connecting with you. I know your practice is opening very soon and you're going to be doing this full time. And you can't monitor every single person every single second, right? So I, I love this idea of having the health coaches step in. Exactly. Yeah. And there's stuff we're looking at too. And an app that the AM could go, here's day one, here's day two, here's here's what to expect day five, here's the what the keto flu is. And you know, so that you can have something that every day they get a message five minutes from someone that's keeping them on track and saying, Oh, okay, this is normal. I was wondering about that. So that you know, you have a, a buddy with you the whole time, you know, and we get text and, and and communicate. I mean, it's really cool what we're coming up with and what you're coming up with. I think, you know, when we can all collaborate and share data and share what's working, I think that's when we're gonna really make some impact. Because Brian, you know the big thing is 
guess who's going to be more interested in this stuff than anyone? It's not the health insurance company. It's the life insurance companies because mm-hmm. they're going to say, hmm, our patients are going to live longer. So maybe they go through your program or they're, they're your patient. Maybe we give them a discount because we know that you're going to help reach those people. So that's one thing that's interesting because we're looking at longevity and trying to help people live the best lives they can. And the more active they are, the less stressed they are, the more they're sleeping. You know, all those things that we, we can do, we can intervene on that's going to make a long-term tangible difference when they're 80 years old and they're still playing tennis. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a mm-hmm. person who's not going to be in the hospital every week or, or getting their foot amputated. So I think it's, that's what we're looking at. Is like, how do we help you age the best you can? How do we make your old car run as, as long as it can, you know, and not have to trade it on the new model? Yeah. So yeah, it's very cool. The life insurance company, that's good because that's, again, the incentives are aligned. That's the magic. They don't want to pay out life insurance. It's a good, good example of how we can align our incentives and and do better together. And yeah, you're talking about where you're getting all the notifications, reminders, all that stuff. That's what we're doing. We're actually just launched the Sapien program. I haven't really talked about it yet, but you can go to sapien.org and you can start it. Like we're doing this part of it. We don't have all the tech built yet, but we're doing it with online tools, right? And, and yeah, you can get, uh, we have a 10 week program where you can go through and it has all the education. We have videos, all this type of stuff that tell you, walk you along this journey and tell you what to expect. All the stuff you said. So we should talk offline, you know, maybe we can collaborate or, you know, share tools and stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. Anything we could do to help people, I think it's, it's just great. And I love what you're doing, man. Everything I see you doing, I've just been so impressed. So it's an honor to come on and get to spend some time with you, not in, in, uh, at a medical conference or something like that but yeah I, I appreciate all you're doing it's it's been amazing watching your journey absolutely well yeah we're doing it together so any other things i guess you know you've talked to a bunch of people what are some uh some big things you're interested in or that you've learned or you know i guess you have mentioned a lot of things you've learned along the way but i mean you guys have probably had i don't know how many dozens maybe a hundred episodes on your podcast yeah, I think we're at 125 right now, right? Oh, wow. So we've been releasing it. But there's so much. My, my daughter, we went for a walk today and we were talking about it. She goes, who, who impacted you the most? And it's great. I mean, because we've had Dr. Unwin on. What a great person and, and so kind. And, and that he taught me a lot about life and medicine and all that. And, you know, just a kind soul. And, you know, Tim Noakes was, Professor Noakes was on. And uh, so anyways, you, you see all these people and, and the impact they've had and what what they learned and what their life experience is. And, you know, I think the biggest impact we've had, Tro and I were talking about, was from some of the patients who were just a total disaster. And they turned their life around. Now they're happy and they're helping other people. And, um, you know, we're having type 1 diabetics who are getting their insulin down as low as they can. And they're doing great. And, uh, you know, coming off seizure medicines. And, you know, when you see this depression, anxiety, stress, all these things getting better think, wow, this is like, we're making an impact. So I've had times where, you know, people will reach out and one of the guests I didn't think was that impactful. Someone will walk in and goes, oh my gosh, that story changed my life. I was like, wow, really? Why? And then you heard their story. It's like, wow, they reached that person, right? So I've seen that where people are just, are inspired by each other. When you see story, uh, pictures of people and their life story or did them telling what, what happened to them or how their life changed. There's nothing like that. You know, when they call it an anecdote, they go, oh, anecdote doesn't mean anything. Well, that's us. That's a life, Brian. When you see someone get better and they can, you know, go hiking with their kids again and they can, you know, play tennis again or whatever it is that they enjoy, think, wow, that's just cool. I was a little part of that. They had to do the work, right? But when I see someone like one of my patients came off, she was in the movie, actually came off 156 units of insulin a day. And She's a perfectly healthy person doing and living life. And so when you see stuff like this, wow, it's kind of cool though. You know, our education, what we go through can help those people. And that's why I wanted to select. I'm selfish that way. I wanted to select for people who care about their health and say, look, this is important to me. Help me out. Let's do this thing, right? I'm, I'm all in. It's like being a coach and the kid doesn't care. You could tell them all you want, but they don't care. It's like a waste of time. They're not going to change. The other thing, Brian, is sometimes you see people who you give up on and then all of a sudden they come through. You know, they get that diagnosis of diabetes. Now they're all in. And we could really make some big impact with that because we can reverse or put into remission, depending how you want to say it, a lot of these diseases. You know, I've seen it and it's amazing. And, and so I think that's part of it. Doctors haven't had that much experience yet. So I would love to, you know, that's part of the things we have docs on all from around the country, around the world who are having success with patients. And so other docs are listening. 
So we're meeting more and more docs who are getting on board. So for us, it's a protection too. The more docs who get it, you change the standard of care. That's the only way things are going to change when you have enough doctors saying, look, I've stopped 22 people on insulin. How many of you, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's when people start start looking, going, hmm, either they're going to change it or they're not. Some people are going to die just you know, as docs clinging on to what they learned 50 years ago. And others are going to say, wait a minute, maybe we can do better. You know, I'm not happy. I'm not seeing the results I want. And so they make changes. And I think that's what I ha ultimately had to do and say, okay, do I want the security of having a paycheck or do I want to really make an impact? And even though I, won't, I might have to borrow money from you for a little while, Brian, but uh, <laughs> uh, but once we get this up and going, I know it, it's going to be great. It's just, uh, it's in a perfect place for me. It's two miles from my house. So I can pop in and see people on, on Saturday morning if I have to and, you know, give that flexibility. Uh, so yeah, that's what's exciting is when we really start seeing the impact. And that's why I love, you know, all of us are seeing the same thing. And it's great that there's not a competition thing that we're all saying, hey, let's all do this together. We all float up and we help people along the way. And, you know, you may be able to reach people I can't, right? And, and I might reach one person that you can't. So I think it's one of those things where we, we all kind of know our role and we do what we can and, and uh, just make as much impact as we can while we're here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we can refer each other patients or if, yeah, maybe use part of our program. We use part of your program, whatever works. I know you're working with Dr. Kristen. I met her at a meetup. I love having these meetups. I can't wait till we're allowed to hang out with each other again and do some meetups. We should come down to San Diego and do a meetup, but meetup as in meets the eating meat in Chicago, Dr. Kristen, who you're going to start working with. Yeah, she's great. She's very nice. She's uh, uh, obesity medicine certified and, and just has that right touch. She's had health problems that she's overcome as a result of lifestyle change. And she was kind of seeing the same thing I was, you know, that she was just working all the time, you know, never had time for herself, never it, couldn't have a good lifestyle. She was in Chicago, so it was snowing and overcast. And so now she's here in San Diego and yeah, and she's really excited to get going. And, you know, she's already has people signed up and she's new to the neighborhood. So we're trying to get the word out about her because once she's here, she's going to be a commodity, you know, cause she's, she gets it and she cares. She and, gets it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I talked with her at the restaurant, went to a Brazilian steakhouse and it was great. So how do people join your new clinic? When does it open? It's, can they do it virtually? How does it work? Yeah, we just started signups actually. So we're excited to see those numbers going up. We're uh, lowcarbmdsandiego.com, L-O-W-C-A-R-B, sandiego.com. And uh, so, yeah, so it's signing up now for, for uh, we have direct primary care and then we have the metabolic uh, maintenance for people who've lost weight that would just want to stay on track. And then also the medical weight loss program where we're, we're doing more intervention, lifestyle intervention, trying to limit medications as much as possible. And with close monitoring, tapering meds and blood pressure meds and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. And we're going to try to build this community down here where, again, we have people that support each other on the journey. So it's going to be a fun road. It's fun already, man. And so, you know, Brian, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on and talk about it. And I love what sapiens doing what you what you what you're doing it's fun it's just fun to see everyone kind of you know just a couple of years ago we met it in, in san diego and it was just yeah, like yeah. neither of us are really doing something you were starting your movie and and uh i've seen your integrity in what you're doing and i love that you know when you interview different people of different backgrounds and you have a respectful discussion if you agree or don't agree i think that that's what we're called to do you know we can't agree on everything you may disagree with me on certain things and you know i've had been on podcasts that are with a vegan doc and and you know and, and it's like cool if you could say hey look here's how i see it here's how you see it cool whatever we can do to help people if you're benefiting people and they're sticking with your program cool right yeah you know, i just see what you're doing so well thank you yeah i think that's so huge actually that's that's one of my biggest lessons is is listening to dissenting opinions and looking at other sides and looking at both sides of things and that's how you learn that's when i i really cemented i think some of my beliefs in nutrition world was by looking at other ways of doing things and understanding how vegan diets work and why people can do well on them for a certain amount of time or how it produces weight loss and you know all these kind of things because if you're stuck in one camp then you don't you can't explain things right so then you're kind of caught and people are like oh well then why does you know my aunt lost so much weight doing low fat so how can that work if you're saying high fat works but if you look at both sides and here in are open then you you can understand all sides yeah, and you start to learn. Yeah. yeah, you start to learn what works for you, what makes you tick, what do you not like, what do you like? Yeah, absolutely. I think those are the things you know when we take things from each other. That's what each guest I've taken little 
words of wisdom and say, oh, that makes sense. This is cool. Hey, maybe try Maybe it applies to that one. Maybe it only works for two people that I know, but cool, right? You know, I think if there's a fear, we get too tribal and we forget to look and say, oh, it makes sense. He's having success. Okay, cool, right? But if you're selling a, a product, then I may uh, uh, be a little skeptical of that. But if you say, hey, look, I don't care. Go buy your food here or, you know, whatever. Where you don't have a vested interest, put it that way. You know, I've seen some things where you go, mm, that's questionable, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, I don't have a problem if someone's making a product that works and is great. And, you know, I've endorsed stuff that, that I think is fantastic that I have no financial interest in. Uh, if I did, I wouldn't endorse it just because that's, I don't think that's ethical for me. Uh, so anyways, I think those kind of things where you say, hey, this is working. This is like, for you know, if, if you're doing grass-fed meat and getting it to people and you believe in that, that's cool, right? I don't, Sean Baker believes what he believes. So if he if he gets paid by a meat company, I have no problem with that. If he's straight up with it and goes, hey, look, here's my bias. Yeah. This is what I do. Cool. So I don't want to make it so that I'm saying, oh, people should never take money for what they do because everyone works hard. I know how much money you put into doing what you're doing. Uh, and I hope you make a ton of move, money on the movie and help people at the same time there's nothing wrong with that you know but well, uh <laughs> documentary is not where i'm going to make money <laughs> but hopefully i'll make some money someday on something but um yeah you just keep doing the right thing and it works out that's what i've learned in life you know you yeah, do the I'm right not thing and people it. see it i'm not know? worried about it i'm not i'm seriously not worried about money at all i left my you know well-paying career years ago and and don't really care i'm doing fine and uh yeah well hopefully we'll just you know start helping people and eventually it'll come back around so Website, low carb MD San Diego. You got it. Dot com. Dot com. Check that out. I would recommend them. I, I, Brian's great. I've known him for a couple of years. Thanks so much for coming on. And uh, yeah, if you're a Sapien Tribe member, you can hear the bonus episode. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Get that free Sapien food guide at sapien.org. Join the tribe and become a founding member for life before we run out of these membership discounts. Go to nosetail.org to get that grass-finished meat delivered right to you. And give this podcast a review and share it with some friends. Thanks so much. See you next week.